Um, I think the whole debate about Celtic ethnicity that we are having for now roughly three decades um, is, well, based on fundamentally flawed logic. It's, it's a non-debate in many ways. Um, the archaeological focus on this debate has focused on ethnicity, and there has been many attempts to uh, identify ethnicity in archaeology, but to be blunt, it's not possible. Um, it's a social concept that we can't capture, because if we take sort of the anthropological definition, um, those who identify themselves, or possibly even are identified by others of the same group as Celts, um, which we've been tending to use in this archaeological debate, if you can't ask the people, you can't answer that question. And we can't answer that, uh, ask them, so we can't. Um, in stark contrast to this is, for instance, the linguistic definition. The linguistic, de li linguistic definition is effectively a Celt is a speaker of a Celtic language. Now that can't be tested in much of antiquity either, but it can partially be tested because it is effectively based on observable criteria. Um, but that definition has been, by some archaeologists, uh, quite explicitly, deemed not acceptable. I find that interesting. Now, I think the problem partially comes from a misapplication of post-colonialism to archaeology. Um, post-colonialism is something that we archaeologists have nicked from anthropology, much like we like to steal our concepts all the time from other disciplines. Um, and, I mean, the core concept in that, or the, the sort of general idea behind that, is letting themselves speak. The people that the anthropologist examines, and in the genus group somewhere, should be given a say in how they are studied. Um, and that is quite sensible in many ways. Um, the reasons for, these, uh, for, for this tenet do vary, um, and there is a lot about political correctness involved in this as well, but there are good academic reasons. Um, to use emic concepts or categories rather than ethic categories in studying contemporary societies that define themselves in various different ways is essential for academic reasons, basically to avoid distorting oversimplifications. We call all the Indians Indians and lump them in a group, while those that we call Indians, which we can't do these days anymore anyway because it's a non-PC term, um, but they don't consider themselves a group and uh, therefore we're oversimplifying and lumping them into something they are not. Now that concept was directly applied to prehistory without considering at all the context that we have in prehistory. And it's a very different context because the one essential thing to use emic categorizations is to be able to ask people how they categorize themselves. And that is something that is essentially impossible in prehistory. So that has led to the argument that we have basically heard in a way made by John today as well, that there is no evidence that prehistoric Britons ever considered themselves or were considered by others uh, to be Celts, or called themselves and were considered by others to be Celts. Now letting themselves speak, as I said, is a quite nice principle, and it's reasonably sound in the ethnographic present. When you can ask people who, are, you, who you are talking about, what they think of themselves. So it's a very, very applicable concept in the present. Even there, though, it is not necessarily overly reliable. Identity is a sociocultural concept, and it cannot bind the scholar necessarily to a particular way of seeing the world. To put a rather pertinent example for this um, in this room, the Austrians and the Germans consider themselves to be absolutely, utterly, fundamentally different. No Austrian would ever consider himself to be a German. The Germans are the bad Austrians. And that's the point. They are Austrians, and the Austrians are Germans, because actually, if you look at much of what we have about the ways of life, the language, 
many things we do, Austrians and Germans, particularly Austrians and Southern Germans, aren't really different from each other. They are actually much more similar to each other than Southern Germans are to Northern Germans. So, well, saying I'm an Austrian and I hate the Germans, well, I don't, but anyway, doesn't say that I'm making a sensible statement in terms of observable cultural phenomena in material culture. It only says that I don't like the Germans, even though I do. Um, <clears throat> so that whole concept, if you effectively have only material culture, is impossible to apply if you cannot ask those you're talking about. For instance, because they've been dead for two millennia. It's pretty difficult. And also, they have not left no meaningful indigenous records. So, effectively, when we're talking about indigenous prehistory, that whole anthropological concept of ethnicity is inapplicable. We cannot use it because we have no evidence either way. Let's give me an example because British has been used for the Britons, um, well, for the inhabitants of these islands, really. Um, the first evidences for this use, uh, for the use of this term, is exclusively by others, so by, not by British people, not by inhabitants of these islands, but by foreigners, colonial foreigners by and large, so bad people. Sixth century BC, potentially, if that text actually exists, in the Massaliot Periplus, a Greek text, though that is only preserved in a quote in a fourth century AD text, so it may not be very meaningful. 4th century BC, in Greek accounts of Pythia's journeys, um, though that is only preserved in quotes from the 1st century BC and AD authors. So we don't have the original text from the 4th century BC either. That term is adopted by Latin authors, mainly from the 1st century BC onwards, or in intensively from the 1st century BC onwards, to describe the people who live in these islands. We also have a late 5th or early 6th century term in Old Irish that is Krusin. And that's direct loan from something like Welsh Prydain, the Welsh name for the British. But the first attestation of the Welsh term Prydain also comes from the 5th, 6th century AD. Now at that time, Britain, if I remember correctly, had been four centuries a Roman province called Britannia. So, that doesn't tell us much. Um, and that it was loaned doesn't tell us that it was loaned in later prehistory, because actually one Irish name that shows the same sound shift from Britonic P to, or actually Latin P, to Irish Q or C is St. Patrick, which in Irish is called Cosrigan. And that means that sound shift could still have happened in the 5th century AD, easily, because Patrick wasn't there before then. So he couldn't have loaned his name before he was actually there. It's a bit of a shame. So that's hardly any evidence for prehistoric self-designation of the British as British. So that means, forget the British Isles, there are no British Isles, at least not in prehistory. It's something that other people say. And I mean, those other people, particularly the Romans, for instance, called people who didn't call themselves Greek at all, Greeks. The Greeks called themselves Hellenes, not Greeks. Well, there was a small group of Greeks who called themselves Greekoi, but they didn't call themselves Greeks. So calling Greece Greece and Greek archaeology Greek archaeology is a serious misnomer if we apply the same concept that we have been applying to the Celts for the last three decades. Now, at the heart of this problem is essentialism. Aristotle argues, and incidentally, a Hellen, uh, not a Greek, um, argues that since not all knowledge is demonstrable, because that would lead into an infinite regress, you would always have to demonstrate that the assumptions you make to make a demonstration are demonstrated as well, so it goes on forever. Some knowledge must be intuitive. He calls that primary premises. And primary premise is um, intuitive knowledge is explicated in definitions. And that effectively to Aristotle means 
giving its right name to the thing. And that effectively again means identifying the characteristics that the thing must have to be the thing. The characteristics that are essential to it, so essentialism. In that rather magical worldview, actually, it's important to use the true name of the thing, because if not, things might get confused. So we cannot use this. And that is what the Celticity debate has essentially been all about. We've been looking for the true name of some people, as if by magic, if we got the true name, we would solve all our problems. I doubt that we could. Fundamental flaw in this is actually a linguistic flaw. Language doesn't work like that, and that has been demonstrated by Wittgenstein in his Tractatus, shown by Popper in numerous works, and shown by many others since, again and again and again. And that's not linguists, that's epistemologists. Words, in the last analysis, are arbitrary signifiers. Of course they have a history of use, and that history of use is relevant, but that doesn't define them. They are not the same as the thing they name. There are no, nothing like true names, there are only naming conventions. And those naming conventions we come up with. Names don't even need a thing to be meaningful. We can use them for fictional things. So things that do not exist at all. So, and they can still be perfectly meaningful. So names, or any words, are only always meaningful in their use. And their use is always in the present. It's what we do that defines them, not what somebody else did. What somebody else did might define our understanding of the words, but it's still how we use them that actually defines them. So what I'm arguing for is that we need to get away from those essentialist ideas and go to nominalist definitions. Definitions that do not describe the essential characteristics of a thing, that do not presume that there is an equation between the name and the thing, but rather provide a convenient shorthand. The linguistic definition actually is exactly that. <clears throat> it's CELT stands for speakers of languages which, for example, have an observable accent of an initial letter in words where similar or identi near identical words in other probably related languages have P, F, or V as initials, like in Latin pater, English father, German vater, but Irish after. Now, if every time I was talking about the Celts, I would need in linguistics to use that phrase, and that's already a, a, a massive abbreviation because there are, of course, many other characteristics that the linguists call characteristic Celtic features, then every debate about the Celts would take three hours just for me to make my initial statement. I would go on and go on and go on and define all those elements that I call Celtic. So the shorthand cuts down discussion time. And we can still explain to each other what someone using this shorthand means when he uses it. To. Because that's what our definition is for. The word X I use for long sentence. So, in effect, I use the name as something that has some or all of the observable features A, B, C, B, and so on. For they, those things that have those observable features, I use the name X. And that name is completely arbitrary. It can be Celt, it can be gummy bears, it can be a completely fictional word. It doesn't matter at all. As long as we can agree, we, as we use it, what it means these features. Now, refusing another's nominalistic definition as not acceptable, as some scholars have done, because he isn't using the true name of the thing, is effectually, uh, effectively uh, a refusal to communicate. Because it presupposes that the refusenik, as I now call him, intuitively knows so, he can't prove it, can't demonstrate it, but he intuitively knows, as a primary premise, 
What is true? X is D. X isn't A, X isn't B, X isn't C, X isn't E, it's D, and only D. And it also presupposes that the thing really exists. We can't just have made it up, it must be there, because otherwise it cannot have characteristic features. And that is effectively a uh, an unwillingness to communicate to the other, uh, with the other. The other basically says, okay, I'm talking about this and this and this and this, and to not talk about this for endless amounts of time, I'm calling this and this and this and this counts. While the refusenik says, whatever you say, when you use that word, you must mean with it what I mean. My understanding is the one that counts, not yours. I don't give a toss about yours. It's my understanding because I am right. I know what is true. I'm not looking for the truth. I'm not interested in talking with you. All I'm interested in is I know what is true. And that is rather inconvenient because in a scientific debate, we should try to understand what the other is saying rather than telling him, no, you're wrong. I know what is true. What you're saying is wrong. Before I can actually say that, I first need to understand what the other person said. If I don't understand what the other person says, or if I'm unwilling to accept that that person might use different categories, might define things differently than I, then the debate is useless from the start. It's unproductive scholasticism. And that is a serious problem in my opinion. Now the Celts is not a historical term. Keltoi might be, Galatai, Gali, Keltai. All those terms are historical terms. But last I looked, I didn't find a single ancient author who ever used the word Celt. I also didn't find any Celt in antiquity who ever used the word Celt. What they're using is in their own language, Keltai, Keltoi, whatever. So Celt isn't a historical term. Celts is a term that we came up with in, effectively, well, one can discuss whether it's the 15th century or the early 18th century, but it doesn't really matter. We came up with it in modernity. It's not in the past. It's a name given in the present, well, ish, present, 500 years ago, um, by scholars to things which have observable features. Yeah. Um, like languages that have specific criteria, specific characteristics, like art that has specific characteristics, things that can actually be defined by each scholar as we like. It's the scholar's decision how he calls his material, not some ancient author's decision. And there's no need in this, and actually, for instance, the linguists that have been bashed about this endlessly, um, there's no need to assume that a thing like the Celts ever existed, and the linguists don't assume this. What they assume, at least most of those I know don't assume this, what they assume, or not assume, what they say is, there are languages attested, and we call them by that name. And in fact, I would say it's unlikely that anything like the Celts ever existed. Some people in antiquity might have called themselves um, Celts when they were talking with classical authors, after a while they might have accepted that term for themselves and used it for themselves, much like I when I say in English, I'm an Austrian, I'm not saying I'm Österreicher, I'm saying I'm Austrian because that's the term you English tend to use quite erroneously for my identity. So if that's unacceptable that we define our terms, then let's stop talking because there's no point in it. Refusal to communicate will get us nowhere. Thank you very much.